A badge of honor. Police officers and first responders wear badges to let their communities know they are here to protect and serve. But that's not how it feels today. And the stress of the job is taking its toll, picking lives through suicide and post-traumatic stress injury. A Badge of Honor podcast features the cast of the same name, Sam Horwitz and John Salerno. Sam, John, and the team offer the first responders workshops through their critical incident stress management teams and mental health liaisons to offer state-certified t Cole credit programs that save lives. It's time to smash through the stigma. It's time to heal from your injury, and it's time to back our blue. Welcome to a Badge of Honor podcast. Here are your hosts, Sam Horowitz and John Salerno. Hey, welcome to the award-winning Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam. Man, Sam, it's been uh, well. Happy New Year! Let me start off by saying Happy New Year, and uh, let's hopefully this year we um, really get our voices heard, and and those people out there that need to help know that you are not alone through two, 2023. So, Sam, yeah, how was your New Year's? Happy New Year, everybody! It is uh, it is great to um, well to be starting uh, another year, uh, another great um, year of podcasts and, and interviews. And because you know, each year we say we have big goals, and the bigger the goal, I think the bigger the dent that we're making. Even though you know these holiday times uh, has been kind of hard. Um, since we traveled to Chicago in particular, uh, what's going on uh, in, in that city and um, downright shameful conduct by uh, the powers that be covering things up um, instead of telling the truth, um, which when you tell the truth, uh, that speaks volumes in terms of being there for your men and women that serve. The, the way they're skating around the truth is um, they're not counting um the suicides that happen off duty at a uniform that are either drug or um uh garage co related or ods or whatever they're really not counting those they call they're calling those well they had relationship issues oh they had a drug issue oh they had this issue they are not addressing the point that our members are physically suffering post-traumatic stress from our daily routines. And they don't want to bring that to the public because they don't want the public to know that the officers are such under stress. They got to stop treating our law enforcement like robots, especially in Chicago. And I saw the Fox News um, or, uh, interview today where they said 20 plus uh, Chicago officers lost their lives, took their own lives. Uh, within a four-year period now two people taking their lives three people taking their lives those red flags those alarms should be sounding now sam me and you went me and you went to uh chicago just before the christmas holidays uh just before december where they had the other three suicides um in that month and we saw firsthand that chicago uh politicians in command are not doing their job but the officers that we spoke to in chicago really need it they want it they are begging for it they say they have you know they have to look outside their department to to find help that is a sad fact right there when you have to start looking outside because the fear level is so so high that you are going to get reprimanded for checking on your mental health well and it came down to also because of forced overtime the time component they they just simply weren't given the time off to do what they needed to do. And, and look, you know, you and I are proponents, longtime proponents of if you're not getting any, uh, anywhere at work, you got to go outside. Well, if you're not get, being given the time off to go outside to get the resources and the help that you need, you're stuck in this vicious cycle. And, and, uh, you know, it's about breaking that stress cycle so that there's a little bit of breathing room. So perspective can be built and uh you know conversations can be had and it just is is a whirlwind and you and i both know that that number 20 over four years is way low um and and you know it's never a black eye on the department until it's a black eye on the department right yep. <laughs> so yeah. so you know the leadership has the ability to handle these things uh 
correctly from the get go. And if you're, if you, you have got so many people pulling and backing the blue and, and supporting our first responders. It's not, it's not a black eye. It's the, it's, it's let people help you. It, you know, and I, I don't know what the, uh, what the internal issues are because some departments are really doing it right. And kudos to those departments out there that are really taking the time to, uh, really get their officers in a mental health balance. You know, they're giving their time to decompress. They're giving their time to relax and 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 heal, you know, after traumatic in incident. But these larger departments, they seem like they are just pushing our officers in an aspect to get them to the point where, you know, they're gonna make poor judgments. They're gonna make uh, life and death decisions with this stress. and. You know, I hate to say that it's a, a, a political ploy to hurt our officers. I, I don't know what it is, um, but it just does not seem right. And it just seems like it's happening too much for anybody, nobody, the, the mainstream media not to be grabbing a hold of this and going, why are we losing over 170 officers to suicide nationwide this year? Yeah. And, you know, you and I, we made a commitment because um, at a badge of honor, it's not about us. It's not about the team. It's about bringing forward amazing resources, whether it be a, a practitioner, um, people we have on the show, authors, um, books, and the and we put, we put on the website, this is books, you can go there and there's a, a lot of books that are very helpful. And, you know, we were just talking uh, before the show to our, our guest tonight. Um, he, he wrote this incredible book uh, that everybody should read, um, both, first responder and yeah. family member, non-first responder alike, so you understand um, what's going on. And we said, hey, we need, a, we need a third edition because it's been a while and there's been a lot more. Um, but to, to, to read the stories in the book and not, it just doesn't seem like things have been curved because when you generate an understanding and you can't generate an understanding unless you wanna face what's going on. You want to tackle the unknown. You want to answer the questions that are going on for you. And for some people that's scary. Um, so they don't want to. And I totally get that because I've been there. John, you've been there too. But uh, we can't we can't deny, keep denying that post-traumatic stress uh, and stress alone is really creating havoc and playing a part in um, the overall performance of our first responders um it also uh goes right to why a lot of them are completing suicide so without further ado i'd like to bring on our guest tonight uh alan cates he wrote this incredible book called cop shock i'm going to put it really close so you can see it um, yeah, i'll bring mine too everybody no, can there you go. <laughs> yeah, go, and, uh, go and get the book alan welcome to the podcast Thank you very much for inviting me and happy new year to you as well. And to all law enforcement and first responders who are watching. Yeah. Uh, before we it's really not, start, and I, want, I just want to jump in at, and I forgot to say this in the beginning intro intro, because this really has a value on what we're doing. I want to send our thoughts and prayers to the NYPD officers who were assaulted this week by a terrorist right. on a new, on new year's Eve. One of those officers, a rookie officer, who's his first day on a job, when we talk about post-traumatic stress, I really hope they handle this the right way for this this officer because this could either make or break his career. This was he just came out of the academy. Um, I wish all the officers well, um, but this should be uh, an eye-opening experience for the NYPD. Since it is the NYPD, I think that they will do something well because they have an amazing peer support group called PAPA, uh, police officers providing peer yep. assistance that has been running for a number of years and has been quite successful in yeah. helping officers get through the trauma that they experience on the job. Absolutely. Papa is highlighted in the book and um, alluded to a bunch of times because when I, page one, I'm, I, I'm in. This drew me in, I couldn't put it down. John can tell you I read through half the book. Uh, when we were traveling on the plane, a lot of the stories in here, especially with NYPD, 
um, because John and I worked in New York, um, we could relate to. What made you want to write the book? Well, that's kind of a long story. In one sense, I woke up one morning and I thought, well, if if uh, Vietnam veterans develop a post-traumatic stress disorder, then I wonder if cops do. And I then um, phoned the Los Angeles Police Department, spoke to the head of their peer counseling unit, and he said, indeed, they do. And he invited me down to talk to some police officers who had PTSD. And that's how it started. And from that point on, I then went to New York and interviewed many police officers diagnosed with PTSD in the New York department, and then across the country. Um, I wanted to see how widespread it was. So I went across the country and interviewed police officers, and I went to Canada, and I interviewed police officers there diagnosed with PTSD. So it was a, a very big phenomenon. Now, when I started this book, there were no books like this that were specifically about PTSD in law enforcement or first responders. There were a lot of psychological studies, but uh, I was just surprised that there weren't any books. So that gave me a lot of encouragement to go ahead with this project. And um, I thought that I would have it finished in six months. I'm a trained journalist. I know how to write. It took me six years. And the reason why is because there were so many issues involved and each of them was, was very complex. And there were many, many studies about each subject. So I was trying to get a consensus of what is true. What is the suicide rate amongst police officers? What is the divorce rate? And you keep, I would keep getting strange statistics. For example, with divorce, I would read that the divorce rate for police officers is below the national average. And then I would read that it was way above the national average. And then I'd read that it is the national average. And, you know, it's hard to get a consensus. So I would interview, I interviewed many psychologists who were involved in research as, as well as reading these. I'd read dozens of studies on one issue. That's why it took me so long. Yeah, it's a it's a subject matter that you you can dive into and end up you know going in individual tunnels, and then you try and piece together the you know the stories of the the officers that shared with you and all the first responders and and uh, connect the dots. And you did a phenomenal job. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, and one of the stories that we're going to talk about um, is an NYPD officer turned firefighter, James Brown. Jimmy, uh, as he's affectionately called, when we come back from our first break. So folks, uh, stay tuned. We will be right back with Alan Cates, author of Cop Shock. Move freely, America, without medical restrictions or penalty. Without medical freedom legislation in place, our rights and freedoms are one vote away from being dissolved. Move freely, America, with one voice, without fear of retribution, achieving a common goal, medical freedom. We the people make our voices heard by connecting with state legislators and engaging a constitutionally compliant medical bill of rights for all citizens. Individually, change is improbable, but as an aggregate, attainable. It's time to act with one voice. My voice. And my voice. And my voice. And my voice. To protect our freedom, creating one voice that cannot be ignored. This requires your voice, too. Move Freely America. Go to movefreelyamerica.org to find a chapter near you. Plug in, donate, and help our legislators defend our God-given rights under the Constitution. Move Freely America. My voice. And my voice. And together with your voice, we're one voice that cannot be ignored. Donate today. Movefreelyamerica.org. Hey, welcome back to a Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam with our special guest, Alan Cates, the author of Cop Shock. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Sam, when we left, just before we broke for a break, we were talking about um, the one of the chapters in the book uh, was uh, one of the guys, James Brown, was a was an NYPD officer turned firefighter, which is not uncommon because a lot of the NYPD guys flipped over to uh, the FDNY um, throughout their careers. It was a better job. It was uh, it was a steadier um, uh, hours. It was just it was just a uh, uh, a better job in, in overall back then. So he he moved over to the FDMY. Uh, and and Alan, you cover his story. Uh, um, you immersed yourself in his story. It was uh, it's a phenomenal story. And uh, Jimmy was very forthcoming in everything that he was feeling and how he got through it. Had this horrible experience. 
Um, as you mentioned, he was a uh, police officer with the NYPD for, I think, about well, seven years. And then he decided he wanted to try something else. So he became a firefighter. He was still a probie on 9-11. And um, uh, he thought it was a training exercise when they started calling everybody over. Let's uh, better head over to the uh, World Trade Center. A um, uh, plane hit it. So he thought, oh, it must be a small plane. Until he got there and he saw the un unbelievable destruction already before the towers even came down. So he went into the, the North Tower and he had climbed up 20 floors. And uh, at that time, the South Tower came down. He said he felt the rumbling. And at that point, he made the decision. He said, we cannot go on. He was carrying the hoses, which, uh, I mean, are they're incredibly heavy. And it had already been up 20 floors. But uh, he just felt something was really wrong. And they had to get out. And so he told everybody in his crew who was with him, let's leave. We have to get out of here because this tower is coming down. He knew it. So they started down the stairs. And he met other firefighting crews going up. And uh, they said, well, we haven't received any instructions. Well, the radios weren't working anyway because of where they were located. So, and he just kept telling them, he said, no, you, you got to get down. You got to get out of here. But they kept going up. And that was the last he ever saw of them. But one thing that, he, that really stands out in my mind is, you know, you see all these disaster movies and you, and you, you see th there are people screaming and pushing people out of the way. You know, I have to survive. He said, that's not how it is at all. He said, when he was going down the stairs and there were, and he was bringing civilians with him and there were firefighters coming up, of course, but when they were going down the stairs, he said, you could hear a pin drop. Not one word was uttered. There were no sounds. There were no screams. People, he said, were calm. And he said, as he went down, people handed him bottles of water and he would hand it to somebody else because he, you know, he didn't need it. But that really, like, wow, that's amazing. Because, I, I mean, I, I just saw a disaster movie the other day. It was the same thing. Everybody's jumping up and screaming. And you know, it makes you feel better about humanity, that humans really have a sense of what's going on, that you know, they don't just totally lose control, it, you know, and that they, that will help, they will help each other. He also described to me how there was one gentleman who, who they were – there were two civilians carrying this gentleman down from one of the upper floors, and he was grossly overweight. There was no way he could go down those stairs, but they carried him. And he said that just so impressed him that, uh, that in his mind, he just felt such a strong um, feeling for humanity that, that we will survive, that there is hope for us. So, uh, so Jimmy got to the bottom, 20 floors down. And he said, I think he said he got about 100 yards away when the tower came down. And uh, he could hear the rumble. And he knew, and he ran. He ran as fast as he could. And he jumped, jumped over a little wall. And just as he jumped, all the debris covered him. He was covered in pieces of cement. And um, knocked off his helmet, knocked off his respirator, um, and by the time he dug himself up, he said he was just covered in dust. He was choking. He had to put his hand in his mouth to claw out the uh, the ash that was in his mouth. But he survived. Yeah, and you know, from, he, the, from, from the minute I started reading that story, I mean, I can relate to exactly where Jimmy was with me being in Tower One uh, when the plane hit it. So, I, you know, and then going... Uh, coming up through the labyrinth uh, underneath at the plaza level into six. And it's that little wall and where he braced himself on uh, building six, which was uh, a shorter building in the World Trade Center complex. Uh, yeah, in my mind, I'm going over the whole thing, knowing exactly where he was and when he just decided to jump through into, uh, into the building. And it's like, oh, my God, am I jumping? Is there even a floor? Um, so yeah, uh, just reading that story, his story was very impactful uh, on me and then relating to his, the way he felt afterwards and, uh, the things that he went through, not knowing, 
you know, if his, uh, in the engine company that he was um, assigned to, which was right there, uh, engine company 10, right at the World Trade Center complex, practically. And, uh, and yeah, not knowing if there, there was anything left and, and his, his stress response um, that he had afterwards, which, you know, whenever anybody suffers a trauma and thank you for highlighting this and, and Jimmy seconded it in the, in the book that whenever, whenever a first responder experiences a traumatic event, there is a stress response and it is completely normal. And the thing that I think sets Jimmy apart from uh, a lot of what John and I see, uh, you know, currently in, in, in the way that we're working out in the community with a badge of honor in our team is that because he served as a police officer, he knew about Papa. He knew about the group that existed and he reached out to them. And even though, you know, he wanted to help at first, but he was in no condition to help. He needed the help uh, first and, and he had that. And the willingness to talk about what he was feeling, the getting dizzy in the shower, uh, having a startle reflex, and boy, do I know all about that. But the willingness for him and the, his recognition that I have to talk about this because the me, John, no. lots of folks that we, we talk to, lots of departments that we work with, it's, it's the stigma is still there where it's like, I, I can't say anything, even though peer support may be available, even though now the, the second edition was 2011, right? 2008. 2008. Okay. So even though in this day and age, 2022-3, we, we know that across the nation, first responders, whether it be fire or police or EMS, created peer support programs and other programs mm -hmm. to help their folks. And yet... Everything that you wrote about is still happening today. Can you argue, oh, well, look, the suicides are down? Well, we don't know that. We know that a lot of departments aren't reporting. Okay, so we can't. So is inflation. Inflation is down, too. Inflation is down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but are you are you surprised when you, when you go through two, two publications, because it's the second edition, um, that John and I read when you when you've written an updated and confirmed research and re research are you surprised that we still have this big issue of officers taking their lives? I'm shocked and dismayed because um, we have known about this for many years. The first edition of Cop Shock came out in 1999. And the second edition, as you mentioned, 2008. And I figured by the time I was putting together the second edition, a lot of these issues would have been solved. And they weren't. And there's still a lot of resistance. And um, I can give you a bit of an overview of why I think that is. And um, it distresses me because what it boils down to is money. They don't want, they meaning uh, cities, counties, uh, towns, they don't want police officers, firefighters um, saying that they need they need help and that they have post-traumatic stress disorder, which has become more common than I thought at the time, um, because it's going to cost them a lot of money. Not only that, but they also uh, don't want the name changed from post-traumatic stress disorder to post-traumatic stress injury which is highly significant word. Because if it's an injury, something they really understand, like a physical injury, then they will probably have to grant more uh, stress pensions, PTSD pensions. They don't want to do that because it's going to cost them money. Yep. And uh, I think we just have to shake government up and say, no, you can't do this. 
You know, these police officers and firefighters, they have earned their pensions. And they should be granted those pensions. When you go to uh, like uh, workman's comp or the equivalent in whatever state it is, um, I have been called by uh, quite a few police officers over the years uh, asking me what they should do because they've been rejected. I said, yes, you were rejected because that's what they do. And I said, try not to take this personally. I mean, how do you not take it personally uh, when you've given such a sacrifice? But try not to take it personally because it doesn't matter what happened to you or what evidence you have or how justified you are, you will be rejected at least the first time. This is what they do. And that really annoys me. Why should that happen? Especially if someone is applying for a stress pension or a PTSD pension, think about it. They have given up their career, the career that they love. And it's not just a job to them, it's a calling. So they have decided, I can't do this anymore, so I need help. And the people who are supposed to help them say, well, you know, well, we reject this because we don't, we don't believe in what you said. And they're only saying that because they want to save money. They want to discourage um, uh, first responders, police officers from filing for stress pensions. And that's the bottom line. And it's still continuing today. Well, we are talking, we're having an enlightening conversation with uh, Alan Cates, who is the author of Cop Shock. Again, everybody go out and uh, grab your copy at copshock.com. And we are going to come back and continue this discussion uh, about the money and why uh, officers are being denied. So stay tuned, everybody. We will be right back. Interested in starting a podcast or TV show? Worried about what you'll say and how to keep it engaging? think you'd like to be a guest on podcast, radio, or TV shows? Hi, I'm Susan Hamilton, owner and founder of OBBM Network, and I would like to invite you to an OBBM media training to get the tools you need for a relaxed and polished performance you'll be proud to share. Our specialized training techniques include role play, voice training, and everything you need to deliver a confident, clear, and engaging interaction. Go to offbeatbusiness.com. Go to the calendar and register for a training that's convenient for you. Dates available now, 214-714-0495. Hey, welcome back to a Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam and our guest, Alan Cates, the Alan R. Cates, the author of Cop Shot. But uh, I want to just, we're coming back from commercial and you, you hit on a certain thing that um, I wanted to talk about was the, the deniability for retirement, they, that the, the cities are re denying retirement benefits for post-traumatic stress. Now, what they're doing, and I just saw an article that 40 police officers, I forgot what town it was, were let go because they were reevaluated. They took a, uh, another stress test or another uh, evaluation test, and none of them passed, and they let all 40 go. They said they were not fit for duty. How are they getting away with saying, well, you were fit for duty when we hired you. Now you're on the force all these years. Now you're not fit for duty and it's not an injury. How do they get away with just firing somebody like that? That's, they can get away with they can get away with anything. And that's, that's, that's the bottom line. What the the way cities think, remember, it's all lawyers we're talking about. Right. They said, okay, well, let them sue us. That's the attitude. And how many how many cops and firefighters have the resources to sue or right. even the will to want to do something like that? Because if they're suffering. first of all, they feel it's a betrayal. And it is a betrayal. Why do they have to fight for something that they deserve? Yep. Absolutely. Let me give you an, an example. I was involved as a, an expert witness in a, in a court case. A, a police officer, uh, it was a state trooper, and... Some guy comes up to his car and points a shotgun at him, like right at his face. Luckily, the police officer was faster and he shot him and killed him. As a result of that severe trauma, uh, the police officer just couldn't go on with his job. And he eventually applied for a stress pension uh, based on a PTSD diagnosis. And I saw all the paperwork that that was involved there was no question that he had ptsd but uh the workman's comp or the equivalent of, of that in arizona 
and said, uh, no, we don't, we don't believe you, so now you have to sue us. So he did. He sued. And so I was brought into the court case. And from, from my standpoint, it was really easy because the lawyer for Workman's Comp said that uh, this is what cops do. They shoot people. So why should he be rewarded for something that he does by getting a stress pension? That was the logic. And it's like, oh, that made me crazy, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, I said, so I, so she, and she also said that uh, shootings occur all the time. So therefore, we shouldn't be rewarding him because that's the job. And then I said, no, it's not the job. I said, and I pulled out some statistics that showed that there was the, the, the number of shootings was something like 0.04% of encounters with, with people. And uh, it was easy to find those statistics because it was on the FBI website. Right. So, you know, I pulled those out, but um, she didn't like what I had to say. So she attacked me and uh, said a lot of really nasty things. And that was okay because I said nasty things back and the judge kept interfering and saying, you know, come on guys, cut it out. But the fact is, I know that I was right. Um, she was defending the town. They didn't want to pay out a stress pension. And um, at, the, at the end of my questioning by her, uh, she said very sarcastically to me, well, you know, basically whatever you're saying is, is hogwash because you're being paid for this, aren't you? And I said, well, actually I'm not. She said, what do you mean you're not? And, you know, I used to be married to a lawyer and she said, the one thing you never do is you ask a question for which you don't know the answer. So she asked me that question, she said, well, why not? I said, well, because it would affect my credibility as a journalist. And uh, this could have worked against the police officer, but in this case, I guess it doesn't. So the, I have to tell the absolute truth and this is the truth. So that Alan, didn't go over well. And by Alan, the way, and the, the judge ruled in the police officer's favor. And this was the first time in Arizona that a uh, police officer received a PTSD pension. And what How year was this? That? Yeah. yeah. What, year? Again? what year? Um, I think it was around 2006. I'd have to check. Okay. So here we, here we go again. And so 2006, 2022, that's 23. And the, the, for whatever reason, yeah. You know, you don't have uh, police officers from either uh, one single department, you know, having a class action or something. You're beaten down. You're stressed out. Your brain is not functioning correctly. The last thing you want to do, yeah. the last thing you really can do in some instances, if post-traumatic stress, you know, left untreated can get really bad to memory lapses, the, the whole thing like that is have to fight for what you uh, should be entitled to. And again, we look at what has happened since that time to now and all of the bills that have passed, um, yeah. all of from from a federal level all the way down to, to municipalities with with um, overhauls of their workmen's comp systems and different thing, things like that. You can read articles from all, all over uh, the United States in these towns. And yet, we're still here. I we're know. Still there, there is, still is this pervasive attitude. And it, it starts with, let me give you, a, let me just continue with that story about the, uh, the case that I was involved with, because there's more to it. And this says everything, because it's about government. Um, I posted the findings from that uh, court case on my website, on copshock.com, where it still is. And... Um, I was called by a number of lawyers who said, um, you know, we see the, all the case information that you have there, but we can't find it anywhere. It's not on the usual legal sources. And, uh, you know, they're, they're like, why? And I said, well, I'll send you everything. You know, I have tons of material. And then um, one lawyer uh, phoned me and he said, well, I can tell you why no one can find that case is because the state of Arizona doesn't allow it. They don't allow it to be published. I said, well, why not? And he said, well, then other people will use it and try to get PTSD 
<laughs> disability cases, like, well, okay. Well, yeah. That, 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 wow, that really, wow. that blew me away. Wow. That just blew me away. But it was the state of Arizona wouldn't allow it. Wow. So we have to go after government. We have to go after towns. This has got to stop. So He's, let me uh, ask you if uh, for for people that are listening, whether you know your first responder, first responder family member, and you're relating to everything that we're talking about, can they go to copshop.com and find like you put everything up there despite it being taken down by Arizona, correct? Let me just be yeah, sure. Or, or they they said I had to take it down. They said you had to take it down. Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, copshock.com. Yeah, uh, yeah go to copshock.com. There's also a lot more information that and advice that I, I give to the people who want to uh, apply for a stress pension, you know, how to go about it, and how tr to try to not take it personally, and to understand what this is about, and why uh, you need a lawyer, and they will do it on contingency. So, you always ask for that, which means you don't pay until you win. Right. Um, but uh, the big issue I know with the lawyer, when I was talking to this with a police officer's lawyer, is um, I said, well, you know, what? Because, you know, he said, well, how much do you want for payment? And, uh, and I said, well, what happens if the police officer loses? And he said, well, then the police officer has to pay you. I said, well, that's not going to happen. I, that is totally unacceptable. And so that's why I finally said, okay, I mean, um, it would have been nice to be paid for my services, but this is not about that. This is about justice. This is about what's right. And uh, so that's why I refuse right at the beginning to ex accept any kind of payment. Al, let me ask your personal opinion on this. Since we've been in these topics, we hit with uh, post-traumatic stress, talking about the money issue within our, uh, our government. And then, you know, looking at the workman comp lawyer who is obviously uneducated in what post-traumatic stress and what police officers do, because I don't think anywhere in my academy said your job is to shoot people. That's not what wasn't my job. They never right. detailed that. Yeah, we all, they, they have, we have your back is what they told them. Yeah. So do you think it's a lack of funding, a lack of education, or just a, a, a total blindness to the the health and welfare of our offices or a combined of all? It's probably a combination of those, but I think mostly it's a blindness, a willing blindness. They just don't want to hear about it because it means they're going to have to do something. And imagine this, they might actually have to pay some money to somebody who deserves it. Right. I know I sound very cynical and I guess I am. After 20 years of this, I'm pretty cynical about it. And uh, I think we need to hold the um, uh, uh, state legislators, uh, every kind of government legislator and, and uh, legislators in towns, we have to hold them to the fire. And you say, you demand that a police officer, for example, or a firefighter, they put their lives in danger for you, and some are killed, some are commit suicide, and now when it's time for them to say, okay, uh, this, is, does this have been my sacrifice, So, and I was willing to do it. And now you have to step up to the plate and they say, oh, what plate is that? Yeah. They, they just don't want to know about it. With all the information that we have had and, and we've learned over the years, since 1999, since your first release of the book, right? With all, Is there any way that any politician, any commander in the field today can claim ignorance on this part? Uh, no, but they do anyway. They do. They pretend that they don't know about it. And then if you inform them about it, they say, well, we just don't have the money. But you have money for other things. Right. Right. Yeah. We're still so, below, we're still below the paper clips. The mental yeah, why is it? Uh, I just want to, yeah. Why isn't this a priority? It should be, it should be part of, we hire a police officer and maybe we're going to have to pay them a pension later. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a pension because, you know, it's just a nightmare out there. I was physically they, injured on a job. They paid me a medical disability. I was physically injured in, on a job. If I mental injury is the same exact thing, but I remember walking into the medical di medical district in in um in Queens, and you know, I saw guys with neck braces on, rods in their head from from neck 
and they were denied three, four, five times. They were walking them with walkers, and they were still being denied. I can't imagine how they laugh at uh, post-traumatic stress because it's an invisible injury. Yeah, that's that's the problem. That's why they don't want the last word of post-traumatic stress disorder to be post-traumatic stress injury. Right. That, is, and, that is the key word. And, and, I think, uh, um, and go ahead. Yeah, and the psychiatrists who developed the the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that uh, that outlines what PTSD is, um, they have refused to change it to an injury. They say that it doesn't capture what it is. I think it does. Uh, we think it does too, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, part of part of the education process. Part of the understanding uh, yeah. process is that um, pretty much everybody that comes on the show is is the understanding that if you're in a situation that you're not quite understanding, you're feeling emotions that you haven't felt before, or maybe mm -hmm. that you have felt before but you're ignoring, um, and you and you've gone and asked for help because you know in Jimmy's story. He did ask the fire department for help and they said, oh, sorry, we, we got nothing. Um, you do like the whole, almost the, the second half of the book. I mean, it starts chapter 13, what to do about cop shock. And from, from that point on, it's, it's page after page of the normal reactions, um, looking for different opportunities, explaining resilience, um, what that, what goes into that, how to find a good therapist, what that means and reading material, um, groups, websites. This is, this is like, this is like an encyclopedia, uh, with, with stories all together. So I, I, John and I, we both encourage everybody again, grab, uh, grab the book. But it's Sam, called Top Shock. Sam, again. You, you, you bring it up, you bring it up, uh, you know, what what Jimmy went through, I want to just I just want to flash back to chapter one with Christine, uh, the transit officer, and this was back in 1985 when she so came. So before you do that, John, we're going to talk about Christine in 1985. We got to take our last break, okay. and then we'll come back and talk about yes, like you said, this goes back to 1985. You guys are listening to a Badge of Honor podcast sponsored by the OBBM Network. We will be right back. What is the role of American government anyway? Is the role of government to decide where I can go and where I can't? Is the role of government to work tirelessly to destroy vital infrastructure that keeps goods and services from my customers? Is the role of government to choose who can drive, fly, or ride according to mandated stipulations that threaten my body, health, mind, and conscience? Without medical freedom legislation in place, our rights and freedoms are one vote away from being dissolved. Individually, change is improbable. But as an aggregate, attainable, it's time to act with one voice. My voice. And my voice. And my voice. And my voice. To protect our freedom, creating one voice that cannot be ignored. This requires your voice, too. Your voice. Your feet. Your vote. Not just at the ballot box, but training to be a poll watcher, precinct chair, judge, or early ballot counter. So you are doing all you can to protect the fairly counted American vote. Move Freely America. Go to movefreelyamerica.org to find a chapter near you. Plug in, donate, and help our legislators defend our God-given rights under the Constitution. Move freely, America, because my voice and my voice, together with your voice, we're one voice that cannot be ignored. Donate today. MoveFreelyAmerica.org. Hey, welcome back to A Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam with our guest, Alan R. Cates, the author of Cop Shock. Uh, welcome back, guys. You know, we were discussing... Oh, we we're discussing um, a wide range of uh, issues that we're having nationwide and probably, and like you said, uh, you visited Canada uh, not too long ago, Alan. I'm sure Canada and, and I was in England uh, over the past summer and, and, you know, I spoke to some uh, uh, first responders there and they're having the same. So it's, it's actually a worldwide issue with all, all of our first responders. It's not just our nationwide. And it all seems to come down to the same thing. Like you said, it's either money, ignorance, or uneducated uh, people within our upper ranks or in our political field. And one thing that really got me is 
Con Conrad Weaver just put out a a, a 9-11 movie and there's a female officer in there who is battling. She is shunned by the department. She she gets all these, you know, she's looked down upon. And then I read your book. I read your book. And the first paragraph is about Christine, who went through the same thing back almost 30 years ago. We have not changed. We have not no. progressed. No. Christine McIntyre's story just uh, hit me so strongly. I knew right away it had to be the very first story. Uh, in yeah. the book. And, um, and and New York alone, I mean, I interviewed probably about 100 officers uh, diagnosed with PTSD. But uh, with hers, um, we met in a hotel room with another officer present there. And, out, and this is, I mean, I'm a trained journalist. I don't react to things. But halfway through the interview, I had to excuse myself and go into the bathroom and I wept into a towel. That's how it affected me. Oh, I bet. Her, and and you see from the story how she had an incident in the subway where a homeless person slashed her throat. And, you know, she was carried out by another officer and put in an ambulance and they had to do surgery. But, the, but nobody wanted to listen to what she was feeling. And she tried to hide it all. And it nearly destroyed her life. And she was eventually hospitalized but finally came out of it. Of course, she could no longer be a police officer, but to try to get a stress pension was nearly impossible for her. She finally did, luckily. I'm just giving a very small version of what the story is, but when you read her story about what she experienced as a, as a human being, nobody should be treated like that. Everyone should feel that they can speak out, they can say how they're feeling. Let me ask something. Did they give her a stress pension or did they give her a... a three-quarter pension because of her injuries? Because they maybe said it was a stress pension and hit it under the injury thing. No, they actually did end up giving her a oh, stress pension. Yeah, well, they did. Very good then. Yeah, which was remarkable, frankly, yes. For, yes. for that time. But she fought so hard for it, and uh, and she she did eventually get it. Now, the right after the book was published, the, the first edition, I started getting phone calls from uh, police officers who said, they were all saying the same thing. He said, I read your book and now I feel normal. And mm -hmm. I realized what this was about. It was about the way they're trained. And well, they, they told me, they said, they're trained to believe that violence is normal and that to express your feelings is abnormal. And said, now I realize it's the opposite. That no matter, you're a human being, no matter how well you're trained, you are going to feel something. And yes, you're you're well trained. So when you're you're at a crime scene, you're not going to suddenly start letting everybody know how you're feeling. But it's afterwards when the feelings start coming in the middle of the night, you have to talk to somebody. You have to get it out, and that's the main key to dealing with with um, post traumatic stress disorder and trying not to develop it is talk. And that sounds like oh, it's so simple. But you know, for a police officer, that's not. They don't talk. Not easy. They no. don't talk to their to their families. They don't tell anybody anything. Yeah, and you you even highlight stories of um, you know Vietnam veterans, a couple of uh, veterans in here, and uh, what was occurring because of the stress on the job, and uh, they would flash back to um, being in the jungle. One was in the in the attic with uh, with his gun, looking for people, and and it's it's. It's incredible that, you know, you've got these stories. What, what hit me about it was that the willingness to talk and that they continue to talk and that for a lot of them, they didn't have, they weren't ultimately diagnosed with PTSD. They had the acute stress disorder. Some of them had to go on medication, but because they all found the courage, uh, had a coworker that would listen, had a spouse that was supportive, they avoided, um, some of them did attempt suicide in the book and, for, and we read about some did complete suicide, but the majority of the stories, that's the piece. That's the piece that time and time again, guest after guest that we have is you've got to talk. Sounds easy. Totally is not. 
because we've been there and we don't talk and we suck. <laughs> like Jeff says, <laughs> we really suck at it. But there are so many more resources that we have back from 1985 to now where um, it is literally pick up the phone and, you, you know, you're anonymous. Um, you know, Alan, this has been absolutely just a phenomenal conversation. You have shed light uh, and gone deep into your uh, journalistic research and how this came about. And I hope people and officers and spouses and significant others will reach out to you because you and I found each other on LinkedIn. Um, but God bless it, America and the world that's listening. Go on, get a copy of this book, okay? It's on the screen, copshock.com. If you're listening, cop, C-O-P, the word shock, S-H-O-C-K.com. And uh, yeah, thanks, John, for putting it up on the screen. Grab a copy from page one. You will be drawn in. But like I said, the second half of the book, if you're not ready to talk, just freaking read. Yeah. Let the words that Alan has put down there, let the research, let it into you. Okay. And go from there. Educate make yourself, sure, be your own advocate. And make sure you get the second edition, it, which includes all the stories from the first edition and, and uh, a lot more. Awesome. Will, awesome. That, will there be a third edition, you think? Alan? It's possible. I've been putting together actually uh, ideas for the third edition because there's okay, just so well, much that's going on. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, we can we can help and, and connect. Uh, you know, even more people. We are there, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alan. Again for coming thank on. You. I enjoyed our conversation, and folks, get the book. Seriously, get the book and uh, get to reading. And if you uh, if you're on LinkedIn. Uh, check out Alan, connect with him there. Like I said, that's where we met. And um, he posts a lot of very cool stuff uh, almost daily. So uh, engage in the conversation and we will be in touch, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Great. Thanks, Alan. You know, uh, and you, you, you captured it right there, Sam. You know, just even reading that book from the first page. I mean, I'm not a reader. I, I mean, you've discussed this. I'm not a reader. My reading comprehension is actually messed up because of post-traumatic stress. I have a, a difficult time remembering things. Um, so I'll read a paragraph and I can't remember what my paragraph was. Well, like to me to read three chapters in his book, it takes a long time because I got to keep rereading and rereading those chapters. But one thing I did find that that book from the first couple of pages pulled me in um, because when he was talking about how he got choked up in a hotel with Christina, I could feel that in his words, oh, yeah. the way he wrote it. And, it, you know, not every author can come out. And I mean, I'm like, now I'm getting chills. Not every author can come out and make you feel what he's feeling. He, he put the words down perfectly where you can really, I mean, I was able to picture her on the train. I was able to feel her emotion. And throughout this whole book, that's what you see. And that's what you feel. And the healing aspect, you hit that hard was, yeah, after this, after a couple of chapters, I want to talk. I want to, I want to share my experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's, that's the whole point of why we started this podcast way back when that yeah. was uh, Mad Radio for so many years, and, and now we're a Badge of Honor podcast. And, um, you know, support. Keep spreading the word. Keep spreading the good work, um, like Cop Shop that Alan R. Cates wrote. Um, get it out there. And the way you can do that is subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, just hit the sub subscribe button. Um, and if you've noticed, uh, we have kind of switched over. We are live tonight on LinkedIn. Thank you, LinkedIn, for letting us go live and uh, Twitter as well. So we're kind of shaking things up a little bit in the social media. Um, so connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, over there, and uh, you can find it under a badge of honor in uh, Samantha Horwitz, or you can you can just type my name in. And then on Twitter, we are a badge of honor one, a badge of honor one, because uh, some professional athlete has a badge of honor. What's up with that? Come on, man. Uh, not like I'm, we're going to be able to get that, <laughs> but a badge of honor one on Twitter. Um, yeah. Connect with us, and uh, you know, 
we have got a, a, a calendar full of events. Um, so check out the website, okay, badgeofhonor.com. You'll see in the books, you'll see Cop Shock is on there um, as recommended reading. But we've got a, uh, a couple of things coming up. First, the big change with Walk the Bridge. Okay, we are we are spearheading walk uh, the bridge over here in uh, in Texas, really in in Fort Worth and in um, Rockwall. It is now the third Sunday at 3 p.m. Go to abadgeofhonor.com, click on events. You'll see it on the calendar where you have to report the address and everything. And the news just did a nice media coverage on walk the bridge in Montana. So with the yes. walking the bridge in Montana, so. I want to big, give a big shout out to anybody who's in Montana doing the walk the bridge for all your work because that was wonderful. Yeah, and we've got uh, we've got our workshops that are coming up, and we also have our first uh, annual golf tournament coming up. And we're raising money to provide scholarships to first responders who want to attend our programs. That's going to be on Friday, March 10th in Garland, Texas. Again, go to our events calendar. You can see everything on that. Uh, as well as additional information um, about Walk the Bridge. And, um, you know, every every day, it seems like we're waking up to chaos in our first responder community. We want to let you know we are here for you. We are praying for you every single day. We have a community uh, that backs our first responders. Thank you for joining us week after week and supporting the podcast here um, to all of our veterans, thank you for fighting so we can continue to do th things like this show uh, week after week. And then for our active duty personnel, thanks for towing the line and keeping us, uh, our nation safe. So, John, take us home. Man, just a uh, big shout out to our Chicago PD and our NYPD. Uh, we are here for you, uh, along with all the other brothers and sisters across the nation. Um, keep up the good. Success is right around the corner. Things will change. Do not give up. Do not give up. Um, and please talk to somebody if you need to. And we hear you, and we will see you next week. Take care, everybody, and happy new year. A Badge of Honor podcast is produced for the OBBM Network podcast and protected under copyright law. For content permissions, please submit your request to abadgeofhonor.com on the content page. For OBBM Network programming information, please call 214-714-0495 today.